tonight at the Virginia Department of Corrections, Red Onion State Prison. To accept this call, press zero. This is Randall Vaughn, and I'm currently serving 1,214 years for capital murder, Red Onion State Prison, in the state of Virginia in the USA. This is my podcast, Red Onion Randy. I hope you enjoy listening to me. You know, I get quite a few questions a week from listeners wanting to know different things, curious about certain things, and so on and so forth. And I've been asked to describe my childhood a little bit more, uh, you know, try to go into a little bit more detail. So I'm going to do my best to to answer that question, to, to give more. This is going to probably be several episodes worth of talking so you know i'm not going to be able to get to everything in one 20 minute phone call unfortunately um but i'll do the best i can as long-time listeners to my podcast and those who watched the documentary solitary look inside red on state prison knows that i did not have a, ch- a happy childhood at all you know it was filled with abuse of one kind or another neglect extreme poverty and so on and so forth but i'm not going to really touch on the violent aspects of it that much today uh, because there was more to my childhood than just violence. Not much more, but some. We grew up in Earliesville, Virginia, which is about 10, 15 minute car ride from Charlottesville, Virginia. We lived right in the, in, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I did, I loved the area because there was, you know, a lot of forest, um, trees everywhere. And, you know, as anybody knows me, I love nature. Out amongst the woods, that's where I was happy because my life sucked as a child. We had nothing. We had no toys, constantly hungry and and, and so on and so forth. But I remember the trailer that I grew up in, and it was a single wide trailer. And it was a light blue on the bottom, and then the top half was painted white. And it had a front door with these three, like, really, really steep, rickety steps. And and they were, like, 65 degrees. I mean, like, they were really steep. It was almost like climbing up a ladder more than it was walking upstairs. And it had no handrail. And it was barely attached to the side of the trailer. I mean, it, it was just nailed up there. You know, it had no supports underneath of it or nothing. I'm surprised one of us didn't kill ourselves. And, you know, you had a couple of windows, and near the back, you know, in my mom and dad's bedroom, there was another door. I guess in case of a fire, you know, you could get out either side of the trailer. And uh, it was really, really small, and we was always looked down on and shunned. It's just white trash garbage because we lived in a trailer. We went to Broadest Wood Elementary School, and, yeah, it was a little country school, but Most of the students who went there, their parents were middle class to upper middle class, you know, and a few of them were actually just flat out wealthy. They owned, you know, like million dollar farms and stuff like that. And because they was in that district, that's where they happened to go to school. You know, if they didn't go to public school, that was. But Broadswood was actually a very, very nice school. Me and my two brothers, uh, Linwood and Jason, were We were pretty much the only poor students there. Back to the trailer real quick. We had running water and we had electricity, but we had no heating. We had no commode. Uh, We had to use an outhouse if we wanted to use the bathroom. You know, if it was like really cold during the winter months, we would just use a pot. Literally, it's a, you know, like a chamber pot from something that you would find a couple hundred years ago. That's what we had to use. Me and my brothers, we had to share the same bed. And at wintertime, you know, it was so cold, we would have a pile of blankets piled on top of us, and we would still sleep in our clothes, and we would be huddled up together, and we would still freeze. When, Especially when we were, like, really, really young kids, there would be times where one of us would wet the bed for whatever reason. And we didn't wake up. We just, you know, even if we did something, we would just go back to sleep, like, whatever. Like, it was bad, you know. And the next morning, we would get up, the clothes would be dry, and we would just go and hopefully eat something for breakfast that morning. If not, we would go to school hungry, 
and we would still be wearing our pissy clothes. And I actually remember one time where I think I was in kindergarten for the second time, or I was just in first grade. I'm not really sure uh, the memory fades that far back, but I do remember going to school, and I remember one of the teachers saying, hey, come with me, and taking me and walking me to the gym and turning me over to the PE teacher, and she took me back to where they had showers for the PE teachers. They had their own little personal, like, locker room. And she's like, get undressed. So, I, you know, I took my clothes off and everything. She's like, get in the shower and take a shower. And that's, like, I had to take a shower. And she took my clothes and uh, put them in the wash machine and the dryer and everything while I was taking a shower. And then just after my shower, I was waiting, of course. I went to school and I smelled like piss because I pissed myself or one of my brothers had pissed on me or who knows, man, it could have been all three of us for all I know at that age. Like, that's the childhood I know. I remember one time we had this teacher. She was so cool, too. She was young. She was like maybe 25, 26 years old. She was blonde, very pretty and perky. And she was from somewhere in England. You know, she had the accent and everything. And she was a school teacher over in Broadest Wood. I don't know how she wound up there, what her story was or whatnot. But that's where, uh, that's where I met her at. And she was just, she was just so nice and kind to me. And... I have chapped lips. My lips stay chapped 24-7, 365 a year. They're never not chapped, so I constantly have to keep chapstick. And I didn't have it at the time, and my lips were it, – it looked like somebody had just took a, 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 a scalpel and just cut the skin off my lips and then just let it just, you know, crust over and cake over with uh, – with scabs and dried blood. I mean, like, that's how bad my lips were. And they burned and were painful and they would crack and split on me. And I remember she, she actually went to the store and she bought a little small, like, tub that you unscrew the top on. And it, it had this, like, uh, this strong, stringent, like, medical spell to it. But it was, it worked. It was really good. And, uh, she, uh, you know, she gave it to me just, you know, out of her own money, out of the kindness of her own heart. She also went and bought me my very first book that I've ever owned. And it was a, a children's book on, um, on heavy equipment, bulldozers and backhoes and stuff like that. I remember her kindness. I, you know, I do. I remember little things like that because we were so poor that even teachers who barely make anything would still spend their money on me or my brothers to help us out. We had our bus driver. During the summertime, she would buy little frozen popsicles, and they were just the cheapest brand you could get. You know, it, it'd have like 50 or something in a box for like two bucks or something. Like, it was, it was that cheap. When we would get off the bus, she would give them to us. I remember certain little acts of kindness like that from my childhood. Those are the things that I try to focus on the most instead of just getting the hell beat out of me or being always cussed out or, or put down and made to feel bad about myself. You know, I try to focus on just a little bit of those acts of kindness because they mean so much more to me now as an adult than they ever meant to me as a child. As a, as a child, I spent my entire life in fear. I was always afraid. I was always afraid to go home. I was always afraid to leave home. I was always afraid to try anything new. I had no self-confidence. I had no self-esteem. The only thing that I had in abundance was anger and hurt and pain and a willingness to fight, a willingness to just close my eyes and start swinging for the fences, just 
in the hopes that somebody would somehow manage to just feel a little bit of what I felt inside. You know, so I wasn't able to really respect those little few things of kindness that I that I experienced from, you know, a teacher or a bus driver. You know, so that's a lot of what my childhood was, was, you know, weeks upon weeks or months of violence followed by one little act of kindness that just somehow kept me going. And I realize that now those little acts of kindness, those little those little blessings from God were what allowed me just to keep going. It just allowed me to keep from falling off the deep end completely. To allow me to just to somehow just to maintain my little bitty grasp on hope. Yeah, it uh you know, I'm getting a little emotional just kind of thinking about all of that stuff because I wonder why. Why did why did that teacher buy me the lip balm? Why did she buy me that book? Why did why did somebody do something nice for me? I still don't know. You know, I just I mean, you know, yeah, I'll sit there and say, okay, well, it was just you know, it was a little act of kindness from God, you know, because it's I say that because it's the only way I can kind of understand and comprehend it because. I'm not used to people doing anything for me. I'm not used to people helping me. I don't know how to understand and comprehend somebody being kind to me because very few people in my life have ever been kind to me. So the people that were kind to me, like it really, really stands out in my memory. You know, like those little bright points of light in an otherwise dark life. Like, I can see those little beacons, and they give me hope. They truly give me hope. So be kind to somebody. Yeah, and that's the thing. You don't have to have millions of dollars to help somebody. You don't have to have money to help somebody. People, you can be kind to someone just by saying, hey, I think that blouse looks very pretty on you, or I like the way you've done your hair. Damn, dude, you look like you lost weight. Man, I love your truck, bro. Trust me, that works with guys very, very well. Compliment their truck, and you're good to go with a guy. But just any little random act of kindness will stick with someone for their life, and it will outweigh the dark things that were done to them. I had to live it hell beat out of me. I was literally been left in a pool of my own blood. I've literally been beaten almost to death. I've been in life or death fights. I've committed murder. I've robbed. I've stolen. I've beaten. You have one minute remaining. I've had an extremely violent, extremely dark life, but those little acts of kindness that a few people have done for me, those are the things that I remember now. Those are the things that I look for now. Those are the things that I focus on now because that light, it'll change you. I'm telling you right now, it may take a while, but it will change the person who you do that act of kindness for. So be kind today. This is Red on your Randy. I hope you enjoyed listening to me. For those of you who listen to me on Apple Podcasts, I would appreciate if you would review me or rate me, preferably five stars, but I'll take whatever you think I'm worth. Don't forget to check out my website, redonyourrandy.com. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you for using GTL.